And now, Veep Thoughts by Kamala Harris. You know, there's so much about what's happening in the world now that is presenting some of the worst of this moment and human behaviors. And then we have a moment like this that I think reminds us that there is still so much yet to accomplish and that we can accomplish. This has been Veep Thoughts by Kamala Harris. BlazeTV.com slash Stu is the place to go to subscribe to Blaze TV. Please do it right this second. Use the promo code Stu to save 10 bucks. We have libertarian comedian and podcaster Dave Smith on with us today. Will Smith gets punished for his Oscar slap. And we start by doing the attack on public education. The left is very, very, very scared that us on the right are going to attack public education. And they've got details. They've got the receipts, boys and girls. Um, And also, they're doing some really good educational programs with their public schools. For example, look what New Jersey schools are teaching their nine-year-olds. Is it normal to watch porn? Hashtag Ask Amaze! Yes! It's normal. Lots of people watch porn. Oh, good. After all, it's right there and it's free. Oh, cool. And anyway, many people are curious about this sex stuff. Yeah. But, and it's a big but, remember, porn is not real. It's just a fantasy, like, uh, like superheroes movies. Bodies don't look like those in porn movies. In general, everything is exaggerated. And sex? It often looks very different in real life. No kidding. So don't expect your own body or sex life once you have one to look anything like what you see in porn. Or to sound like it either. (laughs) There you go. That's uh, recommended to kids as young as nine by New Jersey schools. What a totally normal thing to tell children to watch. (laughs) That's, there's nothing wrong with it, I'll tell you that much. Uh, and uh, definitely don't, don't question it or you hate public schools. Well, you know what? There's a lot to hate lately. I don't know if you've noticed this. Salon has come out and they have decided they're going to try to stop all this progress that parents have been making around the country and going up to their school boards and complaining about such things. And they're especially targeting a guy you know from this program and, and, and others on The Blaze, uh, Chris Rufo. Chris is a guy who we've had on uh, several times. Uh, he's one of the people who've really led the, um, the uh, attention uh, gathering uh, as far as uh, CRT goes, along with James Lindsay and some others that we've talked to. And it's been an important part. Chris's, Chris's reporting has been crucial to this. He's been able to uncover a lot of these programs at big companies, in schools around the country. And the left has noticed. And they said, uh, we want to take this guy out. We're done with him. Uh, let's attack him. And so the salon has put out a piece. The guy who brought us CRT panic offers a new far-right agenda, destroy public education. Now, is he doing that? Let's look at what they have. What is the evidence, of course, that they promote uh, and provide in the Salon article? Earlier this week, the man who's been widely credited with single-handedly willing the critical race theory panic into existence, which, of course, in quotes, it's not real. The panic's not real. Obviously, we should be judging people by skin color, uh, even if the truth is more uh, complex. Laid out a new set of marching orders for the right. Defund public universities. Discard academic freedom. Hmm. Remove credentialing requirements for K through 12 teachers and generally foster so much anger against public schools that it drives a nationwide popular movement to privatize education. Sounds wonderful. 
that, that's the type of thing that uh, this is the scare tactic now. Um, first of all, they can't get their stories straight on CRT. Is it real? Is it fake? Is it being taught? Is it not being taught? Is it a good thing? Is it nothing? They can't figure it out. The bottom line is, uh, and CRT, of course, is more complicated than one or two slogans, but so much of this goes back to telling people, particularly children, that they should judge others based on their skin color, that their skin color is their defining characteristic and is the most important thing about them. This, to me, for lack of a better word, is bananas. Don't do it. Never, ever in your entire life make any decisions based on skin color. That is a a pretty low hurdle to clear in the United States, but the left no longer wants to clear it. They've decided that skin color is the thing that you should judge people by. I'm never going to uh, uh, subscribe to that. I don't care what they say. I don't care at all. I'm not going to make decisions based on skin color. That's the wrong thing to do. Maybe I was told an old antiquated MLK dream, but I'm going to keep going for it because I have no use for this. And you shouldn't either. And I don't think you do. And in fact, I don't think most people do. I don't think most people uh, really believe any of this stuff. But the left keeps propagating it. Or if they realize you're not going to like it, then they'll tell you it's, it doesn't exist and it's not being taught in schools. So they can never make up their mind on this one, but we'll try to chase uh, the tail a little bit here. Um, Rufo suggested that much of his work to heighten public outrage around schools handling of everything from U.S. racial history to the pandemic to gender and sexuality could serve a larger goal, creating the conditions for fundamental structural change. For example, he said, to get universal school choice, you really need to operate from a premise of of universal public school distrust. Now, is this some secret plot or is this obvious reality? The truth is, and this wouldn't stop me, it wouldn't change my mind, but if the public schools were actually working for parents and children, there would be very little passion to privatize them. There would be very little passion for homeschooling. There would be very little passion for pod schools. The problem here, of course, is with teachers unions and what those teachers are actually teaching the kids when they show up to school, which more and more often is rare, is that they're not working for parents and they're not working for children. So parents are looking for another option. This is not Chris Rufo trying to explain to parents that judging people based on the pigment of their skin is a bad idea. They already knew that. They didn't realize it was going on as often as it is in public schools, but they already knew that was a bad idea. And as soon as they found out that you were teaching that to our kids, they were going to bail on you. And we've seen massive amounts of people who have moved from a, a public education to private education, uh, to, from public education to homeschooling. And really the biggest driver of this, of course, was COVID. What did these teachers unions think was going to happen when they decided they didn't want to show up for multiple years at some point, parents think, I don't know, maybe my kids should learn how to form a sentence or something and maybe should go to school. Maybe they should go to at least be taught by somebody somewhere. You guys don't seem to want to show up. Imagine if you were in Chicago when cases are at these super low levels and the, the, the teachers are still saying they don't want to come back. I mean, it's completely ridiculous. The story goes on from Salon. Rufo didn't stop with K through 12 education, going on to describe public universities as a monopoly that has been uh, too long handled by uh, too long handed a blank check by legislators, even in conservative states. Conservative legislators who don't like what's happening at those schools, Rufo said, should use their budgetary power to enact the changes they want to see. That's just a job description for the representatives. That's not a secret radical plan by Chris Rufo. That's just what they're supposed to do with their day. I know we, they get into a lot of other stuff. They are, they're, they've got these important uh, meetings. They're smoking cigars. They're drinking, uh, they're drinking some nice beverages. I understand a lot of that stuff goes on. But their job is to make sure that if uh, things aren't going well, they're supposed to change them. And if one of the powers of, uh, that they have is the power of the purse, they're supposed to cut off funding to things that aren't, you know, good Look, the truth is that we do need to rethink everything about the way we teach our kids. And it's not just about CRT. But in some ways, that's one of the things that have awakened parents around the country, along with COVID restrictions and really super impressive first year female swimmers. The accusations against Chris Rufo here are serious. 
that he secretly is trying to eliminate public schools. The story provides very little evidence that this is actually his hidden goal. He seems to be mostly talking about school choice, which gives you a choice between public and private schooling. But hey, while we're talking about eliminating public schools, let's eliminate public schools. I don't know if Chris wants them eliminated. I don't know. I can't speak for him. But if he doesn't, I'm right here cheering on their elimination. We know that private schools and homeschooling consistently leads to better outcomes. Uh, 78% of peer-reviewed studies, studies on academic achievement show that homeschool students perform statistically and significantly better than those in institutional schools. We know this. We've known it forever, and I think everybody knows it, really. Why would we stick with something that we all know isn't working? And that means rethinking everything. Public versus private is just one thing to consider. Where else do you choose public when you have those two choices? Private park or public park? Private pool or public pool? Private bathroom or public bathroom? Ugh. How could we afford all of this? It's too much money. Well, I don't know. Maybe give people back their tax dollars and let them decide what they could do with them. That would solve the issue of cost for a lot of people. What's interesting is, while the left would love to argue with you and tell you that we need to redistribute the money from those evil rich people to poor people to cover all the costs of education, they don't seem to enact that plan when they have control in their cities. There's this one county that contains the city of Chicago. It's called Cook County. The residents here voted overwhelmingly for Democratic candidates in the presidential and senatorial elections last year. Often what would happen is that this would just be one big school district and that all the taxes from all the towns in this county would be put into one bucket and distributed equally throughout the county. But the residents of this very blue Democratic county have actually decided to divide themselves into more than 140 school districts. Oh. So now you have all these tiny school districts like this one, which are like gerrymandered around the richest part of town. And so all of the taxes from these rich homeowners go into one little bucket and then only get distributed to the schools within this rich region of the county. It can be on the same block that the town line runs through the middle of it. And if you live on one side of that line, you're consigned to an inferior education by virtue of the fact that you and your neighbors don't have as much money. And if you live on the other side, you're basically a member of a club that is sponsoring a private school, essentially, for the benefit of that small group of kids who are lucky enough to live in that affluent community. And the result is that poor communities have less money to educate their children, and rich communities have more money to educate their children. This is crazy. This is crazy. Remember, that's not from The Blaze, that's from the New York Times. We can also rethink everything about school, and we should. John Taylor Gatto is a former school teacher, and he put it this way. Although teachers do care and do work very, very hard, the institution is psychopathic. It has no conscience. It rings a bell, and the young man in the middle of writing a poem must close his notebook and move to a different cell where he must memorize that humans and monkeys derive from a common ancestor. We interrupt kids with bells and horns all the time, and they will learn that nothing is important or worth finishing. Hmm. Is it really the right approach to send your kid away for half of their waking hours for most of their entire childhood? Why do our kids need to be gone all day? Have we ever questioned the convenience of this schedule? Have we ever wondered why they make it so easy for us to ship our kids off to an institution where they're a captive audience all day, uh, listening to someone who isn't, you know, you? Shouldn't we be more critical and questioning of the place we're sending our kids eight hours a day? Why are they so defensive when we do question it? Is it really the right approach to advance every kid the same pace year by year? Like our grade levels, even the right approach at all. Why do advanced kids not just move along a little bit faster and other kids have more time? What about, uh, you know, I think about this. What other part of life do you interact with only people that are your exact same age like you do in school? Why are kids always being taught in the same format? Teacher in front of room, kids sitting silently if, if we're lucky. Maybe older kids can learn something and reinforce what they have learned in the past by helping to teach younger students. In my kids' school, they have a program where older kids spend time buddying up with the younger kids to help them learn. The younger kids, you know, basically think they're celebrities, uh, but it also helps the older kids. We spent so much time talking about crazy university professors and not nearly enough time talking about K through 12. Once they're in college, it's too late. 
they're probably already insane. But we can at least give them a foundation to work from and when they're you know, nice and young, and then let them decide to screw their lives up on their own later on. We can rethink all of this, like, and this is crazy. <laughs> I, I know I'm going down some weird roads here, but follow me a little bit. What if we don't punish them with a decade plus of terrible public schools? What if we don't consistently tell them that America is the great and only evil of the world? What if we don't tell our kids that their skin color is the most important thing about them? What if we don't let a six foot three, 225 pound man destroy all the female athletes? What if we don't constantly flood their lives with pornography at nine years old? Call me crazy, call me wacky, but I think that approach just might work. When you're running a business, HR issues can kill you. Uh, wrongful termination suits, minimum wage requirements, labor regulations. Honestly, I, I, I you know, of course I have a million brilliant business ideas and all of them would be make me a billionaire, but I am too intimidated by the process around HR and building a company and figuring the whole thing out. HR manager salaries, you wanna hire someone, you can do that. It's about $70,000 a year, but not with Bambi. Bambi is B-A-M-B-E-E. -E. Uh, they are created specifically for small business. Your dedicated HR manager is available by phone, email, or real-time chat. Uh, from onboarding to terminations, they can customize your policies. They can help fit your business. They can help you manage your employees day to day. And it's all for 99 bucks a month. It's month to month, no hidden fees. You can cancel anytime. How can this be this easy? It is with Bambi.com slash Stu. Go there right now, schedule your free HR audit. It's Bambi.com slash Stu, B-A-M-B-E-E. -E. Don't forget the slash Stu part of the address because that's how they know you like this stupid show. Bambi.com slash Stu. Joining me now in the studio is Dave Smith. He's a comedian and, of course, host of Part of the Problem, the podcast you got to be sure you're subscribed to right this second. Dave, how's it going? Very good. Thank you for having me. Welcome to Texas. Yeah, love it. Always happy to be in Texas. Yeah, it's, 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 it's nice down here. It's, it's a, been a different experience over the past couple of years. You're up in, you were in New York City, right? Well, I was in New York City at the very beginning, but I, uh, I got out quickly. What was it like being in New York at the beginning of all, of all this? Oh, I mean, it was, it was pretty nuts. Um, it was it was crazy how quickly the the shelves emptied. Yeah. Um, and I got out very early on in March. Uh, got the family out of there. I saw the writing on the wall. But mm. I have family in New York, and I I was driving in in uh, it was the first week in April, and me and my wife drove in, and I was like, uh, baby, we got to drive through Times Square, even though this was not on our way. I was like, I just need to, and we drove through Times Square the first week of April, and there was no one on the streets in Times Square. Uh, a few cops, but no one else. No business open, nothing. And for anyone who's ever been there, it's, yeah. it felt like you were like in a Will Smith movie or yeah. something like that. Like it, was in, <laughs> it was just insane to look around and see this. And then you had people like giving you weird looks because I was coming in to visit. And you're like, you're not supposed to be visiting your family. And right. I'm like, well, like my mother seeing my daughter is actually pretty important to me, so I'm going to go do that. And it's very bizarre. That's been kind of, I think, one of the strangest things to me in that watching all this happen, I was surprised that, that this could happen in America. Yeah. You know, I remember even when it was happening in Italy, a couple weeks before it was happening in America, I was like, this is insane. They're shutting this whole country down. I can't believe they're doing this. That could never happen here. Two weeks later, it was happening here. Yeah, which is a good a good lesson for all of us. Yes. That whatever you think can't happen here, <laughs> well, actually it can. Mm -hmm. And that's that's a good lesson in general when you look at the rise of totalitarian regimes around the world. You know, it happens in other countries and we're like, well, but this is different. It's like, well, actually we're all human beings. And yeah. it is possible for it to happen here. And the idea that something like um, the, the Bill of Rights is going to protect you from that is something that I think... Hopefully, a lot of conservatives have woken up to that yeah. as, mu as great as the Bill of Rights is, it's, it's just words on a piece of paper. And if some governor comes along, like the governor in New Jersey, uh, you know, if, if he comes along and says, well, I'm not thinking about the Bill of Rights. I'm arresting people for going to church. He's got the guys with the guns. Yeah. And that's what really matters. Yeah. yeah I, I was surprised to see, I don't know, the, the, I kind of felt there was an American spirit here that would push back on this. And eventually, I think it did happen. Yeah. It just took longer than I realized. But there was, I think, the whole time, this sort of underbelly 
of people deciding to just maybe not maybe not announcing it, may, you know, maybe not making a big deal about it, but just doing their own thing. And we had a, a mask mandate here in Texas for a while. And I'm convinced I cannot get this confirmed from the governor, but I'm convinced they never actually find anyone under this statute. They put it out there. I don't know why, but it wasn't being enforced. No one was being fined. And people just wound up assessing their own risk, which I think is how you're supposed to live. Well, yeah, and that it certainly is how we live in a million other ways <laughs> in life all the time. And that, that, that's, it's a very nuanced thing to assess risk, right? Like mm -hmm. if, some, if, if someone were to say to you, um, you know, I'm really concerned about car accidents, so I got a very safe car, and I always wear my seat belt, and I have dual airbags, and yada yada. Sure. You might go, okay, that's pretty reasonable. And if someone said to you, I'm very concerned about car accidents, therefore I will never get in a car again. You're like, that's, yeah, that's a little bit yeah, nuts. Yeah. Like, that's just, you know, there's like this, this happy medium you have to find. And the idea of like, okay, there's this upper respiratory virus going around that really is a problem if you're very sick or if you're very overweight or if you're very old mm -hmm. to get. Um, and your response to that is, <laughs> Well, I'm going to stay in my house and never leave again. <laughs> right. You're like, that is freaking nuts. Yes. And so many people fell into that. But I do agree with you. There still is a, a remnant of an American spirit that loves freedom. And you did see that. There were, I thought it was truly heroic, some of those businesses that just, uh, you know, practice civil disobedience and resistance that we're not going to close. Even in New York and New Jersey and Los Angeles, there were examples of that. And that's I think we should all look to those guys with a lot of admiration. Yeah, yeah you, you need that. Um, one of the first pieces of analysis, the think pieces that came out right after the pandemic started was, well, this is it for libertarianism. <laughs> you know, I guess, oh, nobody's a libertarian anymore. And I, that's not how I saw it at all. I, I felt like the only thing that got us out of this was the sort of libertarian spirit of this country. What, how do you react to that well, analysis? I think this happens over and over and over again in American history. Um, but this one was like the most blatant. Where, so there'll be a crisis right in the moment when everyone's terrified. They go, see, this disproves libertarianism, <laughs> right? right? Yeah. I mean, this was, this was true uh, uh, when George W. Bush was president, too, after 9-11. Mm -hmm. They're like, well, look, he ran on a humble foreign policy, but that's all out the window now. Mm -hmm. And he might have been talking about small government, but we need the Department of Homeland Security and the TSA and all of this because, look, proof. We're all scared. It's a crisis. But then, mm -hmm. as you get more information and you see the results of all of these policies, you're like, Oh, no, actually, we didn't need to do any of that. And in fact, th this has all caused way more problems. And now, you know, you'll see right-wingers in America who supported George W. Bush and supported the war on terrorism. And now the war on terrorism has been turned domestically, turned inward. Mm. And who are the targets? The same right-wingers who yeah. supported it being created. And for the COVID example, I mean, yeah, well, look back at it now and say, okay, these, uh, these, these draconian uh, totalitarian lockdowns did nothing. There's all types of uh, studies out there at this point mm -hmm. demonstrating they did nothing to mitigate the virus or next to nothing. Um, but it did destroy tens of millions of people's lives. And they did destroy like an entire generation of children. Um, they <laughs> did, we did di completely destroy our currency by printing all of this money and just handing out checks. And so I don't know, you ask me, libertarianism is looking pretty darn good <laughs> I know. right about now. Now, and all you have to do is run the counterfactual. What if we had just handled this in a normal way? Like you said, let people assess their own risk, mm -hmm. not destroy the economy, not debase the currency. We'd be in a much better position right now. Let's go to the currency because this, uh, this has been kind of a, a thing that conservatives and libertarians have been talking about for a long time. You spend too much money, eventually this is going to come back and bite you. And we kept doing it. And it got worse and worse and worse and worse. And then we hit a real crisis where uh, businesses were closing down, sometimes by force, sometimes just because no one was going out mm -hmm. anymore. Uh, multiple trillions of dollars are flowing through the government. And that was in a Republican administration. Um, now we're, we're seeing the other side of that. We're seeing inflation out of control. This is what you know, Austrian economics has preached about forever. How do you get this under control? Well, I mean, the, the only way to truly get it under control is to rein in the Federal Reserve, have some type of commodity-backed currency. That fiat currency destroy nations. Mm. And so that's the heart of the problem. But as you said, libertarians have been talking about this for a long time, and some conservatives, some really good conservatives have been. And the problem is that conservatives support Republicans, and Republicans mm -hmm. are a bunch of Democrats. <laughs> and that's basically the problem. Especially so, on that, at, well, at this point. I, I, look, at spending, you just can't say anything else. I mean, George W. Bush 
and Donald Trump were absolute disasters mm -hmm. in this area. And they they railed against the big spending under the, the Democrats. And believe me, they're Democrats, too. They're really bad. But as soon as the Republicans get in there, there is no will. And even, you know, after railing against Barack Obama's insane spending, then the, Donald Trump gets elected and the Republicans had the House and the Senate. And they still passed through higher spending than Obama ever had. Mm -hmm. And I mean, if that, so a lot, again, I'm fine with blaming Joe Biden. Joe Biden has a lot of blame for the current inflation. But this really is years in the making. And Republicans have, have over and over again promised to rein this stuff in and always failed to deliver on that. Yeah. And, I, you know, I, I think there was, there's this like been this tug of war that's gone on between the two parties, uh, the two major parties for a long time, which has been basically Democrats say they want to spend a lot of money. Republicans say they don't, but then wind up kind of doing it anyway, but in maybe a slightly more restrained way. And uh, usually Donald Trump switched that around because he yeah. didn't. I mean, to be fair to him, I guess he didn't run on. I'm going to cut government. I'm going to cut these major programs. He, that was not his focus. He, in fact, he was beating up other Republicans on stage who were saying we're going to cut Medicare and Medicaid. Um, he went for it and he went for it when he got into office, now, too. And now that the Republican Party has become more Trumpian, there really isn't the other side of the spending argument. We do shows on spending all the time, and there's not a ton of passion for it, honestly. I'm going to still do it because I don't care. But they, they, there's not that audience um, overwhelming uh, desire anymore to talk about reining that in. And without that other side at least talking about it, I t I'm terrified of what comes next. Yeah, well, it's, a very, it's very bad news because whether or not it's the sexiest issue that everybody <laughs> wants to talk about, and I understand. I mean, I understand where, like, if you're like, oh, my God, they're trying to propagandize my six-year-old and teach him about gender fluidity, yeah. that gets more of a visceral <laughs> reaction. Yes, yes. Like, okay, what are these monsters doing? Mm -hmm. um, whereas, like, government spending is kind of wonkish and not as exciting. But if you start, as people start to really feel the ramifications of inflation and price inflation, I'm hopeful that that becomes a little bit more of an issue that they want to talk about. Because yeah. th this really is, I mean, inflation is far worse than the CPI tells you it is. I mean, like, they don't even count housing and uh, energy. <laughs> right. In the, or kind of a big deal. Yeah. You know, yeah, yeah, to most people. Yeah. Yeah. Having a place to live and gasoline in your car is mm. fairly important. It, um, and now that people are feeling that, I, I think it's like, oh, what's causing this? And then hopefully, I mean, look, the last time when Ron Paul ran for president in 2008 and 2012, young people were screaming, end the Fed, and they were excited about that. Yeah. A big part of that is because you just had the crash in 2008. People are now like, oh, what created this bubble? What led to all of this? And they realize this is where it's coming from. So hopefully this gives us another opportunity to at least talk to people about, like, no, this issue actually really matters. Another big thing that rose out of that moment was cryptocurrency mm -hmm. and people deciding, hey, maybe this whole system is crazy and we should do something else. Do you see, uh, the, the, do you see a bright future? With, yeah, I, th I think so. I think the more um, the the more that the dollar loses value, which it's losing value at a rapid rate right now, I think the more interest people are going to have in Bitcoin and also just in the traditional gold and silver and things like that. But of course, people are looking for a way to protect their wealth. Um, let me switch gears a little bit to another issue I get pushed back to, uh, on. Uh, because the word libertarian is interesting in that when I when we were coming up, we were doing the show during like the Tea Party era. It was a I would say it was a it was an ideology that some conservatives didn't fully agree with, but generally really respected. Like, right. OK, we think you're a little too small government. You know, <laughs> we think you're a little too pro freedom. Like these criticisms were 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 light. They were like, OK, well, maybe we can't go that far. And, uh, you know, that was sort of the push and the pull of that moment. It's different now. I mean, I, you know, just just judging, you know, we, I, we deal I'm on the radio with Glenn. We talk to the audience all the time. Libertarians now use more as a slur. It's used as a like, oh, well, all these libertarians don't want us to crack down on big tech, for example. Right. People, I think, rightly see there, there are problems with big tech. They're pissed off that they can't tweet the things that they want. They're sure. getting shut down. The left isn't. How do you deal with that as a libertarian? Well, OK, so first off, just to say, I think a big part of the reason why the term libertarian is, is looked at in a different way now is because back then it was Ron Paul that was really representing libertarianism. Mm -hmm. And there was, it was very hard for anyone to argue that this wasn't a serious man mm -hmm. who yeah. had a really serious worldview. And since then, it's been like Gary Johnson, and it's a little <laughs> bit easier to <laughs> dismiss that right, right. as not being so serious <laughs> yeah. um, for you know, obvious reasons. <laughs> and so 
I think that what I, my whole thing is that I come from like the Ron Paul camp of libertarianism. So mm -hmm. my thing is these are the people who are warning you about devaluing the currency, warning you about the rise of the, nas the national uh, security apparatus and the spying regime, warning you about being an empire rather than a republic and the policemen of the world and all of this. And very important things that I think they were right about that are destroying the country. Mm -hmm. um, with the big tech issue, I think that conservatives are absolutely right to recognize that this is a serious threat and a serious threat to free speech. Maybe not strictly the First Amendment, depending on how you right. think of it, but maybe. Um, but certainly the spirit of a free country where you can express yourselves. But as I, I like to always mention is, is like, look, there, 2014, 2015, there was none of this crackdown on free speech and social media. People weren't getting kicked off. People said whatever they wanted to on mm -hmm. social media. It was the wild, wild west in the best sense of that word. As a libertarian, that's high praise. That's, high praise. Yeah, the that's wild, a good wild thing, west. yeah. <laughs> um, and what happened is after 2016, when Donald Trump won, the entire political and media class decided that they needed to crack down on this because he won through uh, you know, Twitter. Mm -hmm. And so they, they made up this lie that it was all Russian disinformation, and they hauled the, the heads of the big tech companies before Congress and threatened all of them, had explicitly threatened all of them if they didn't start cracking down on the fake news right. that was out there. Of course, yeah. CNN isn't fake news, but those guys are. And so basically, this was government intervention in the marketplace. There was no natural incentive for Twitter and Facebook to want to kick everybody off of their platform. They want everyone to be on their platform. Mm -hmm. But now there's this state-induced you know, induced incentive that you really don't want to be on the wrong side of the power source. So whatever the solution is, that's what caused the problem. Hmm. Um, well, last one here before we go. Um, who do you see as the as the future of libertarianism? You see, obviously, Rand Paul is still in the Senate. Thomas Massey is, is a great guy. We like him a lot in Congress. Who, who's who's the voice? Yeah, well, I love, I love Massey, and I love Rand Paul, and I think those guys have been heroic through the whole COVID regime. But I'll tell you, I think the Libertarian Party is going through a big shakeup right now. The Mises Caucus guys, which is my whole camp in the Libertarian Party, mm -hmm. we're about to really grab the, the steering wheel of that party. And I think there's going to be a whole new era of the Ron Paul revolution in the Libertarian Party. So I'm very excited about all of that. Where can people go to get involved in this if they want to? Uh, LPMisesCaucus.com. All right. Do that. Do that. Dave Smith, comedian and host of Part of the Problem. It's a podcast. Make sure you subscribe to it. Check it out today. Dave, thanks for coming on the show. Thank you so much for having me. Will Smith is now going to be punished from the uh, Oscars. They're gonna, he's going to have to miss 10 years of the Oscars, which honestly, is he going to make a movie good enough in the next 10 years to win an Oscar? I doubt it. I, did anyone see the Serena thing, the Serena Williams? Did anyone see that movie? I didn't see it. I didn't bother with it, but uh, I don't know if it was any good. But the slap thing has been an interesting sort of arc because... When it first happened, it seemed like the left jumped to his defense, and they loved him, and they didn't remove him from the, from the ceremony. He won the award. He seemed to get a defense from the left. I was just seeing, reading a story just the other day that any criticism of Will Smith, particularly from white people, was just a judgment of black behavior. It's like, I'm not judging all black people. In fact, I'm pretty sure Will Smith hit a black person. I, I mean, again, maybe the color of my TV isn't working all that well, but I'm pretty sure that's what I saw. And now we're supposed to sit here and think this is some racial issue for being critical. I don't think Chris Rock was excited about it. Uh, and he was black. Honestly, I don't think most black people were like, oh, good job there. Go hit a guy who made a joke about uh, your wife's hair. I really doubt that was a big uh, issue. But uh, now... It seems to have changed. The tide has turned a little bit. The Oscars are, are they, they threw him out. He's lost uh, some development of shows and movies. And now 10 years, no Oscars for uh, Will Smith. Elon Musk is uh, going to address uh, the Twitter staff, which is this, this is the way you do it. You know, we've, we talked a little bit with uh, Dave Smith earlier about big tech and what do you do about it? And it's a tough thing to deal with, especially if you don't like government in involvement. And we also, we should point out that when government does get involved, they can do something. It just usually sucks. So solving it with big government is very difficult to do. Uh, solving it without big government is pretty difficult to do. Elon Musk is like, what if I just buy it? You know, if I just buy it, then, then can we get this over with? He is now going to uh, address the Twitter staff after people uh, inside of the, of the company are a little upset because he doesn't want to censor people as much as they do. 
they don't want people to say the things that they want to say. And Elon Musk is saying, you know, what if we let people say the things they want to say? It's a really tough one here. I don't know which side to go with. Uh, there's one right side and one wrong side. It's hard to see which one is which. Is it the people who want to silence their opponents or is it the people that want to hear everybody's voice and everybody's argument? I thought that was an easy uh, question to answer in America. Apparently, apparently not. Uh, and uh, of course, this might affect Elon Musk as well in some way. L.A. has banned official travel to Florida and Texas. And what's happened here is you can ban official travel from Florida to Texas because everyone who wants out is already here. Uh, we're all, <laughs> you guys, we, everybody I know who's moved in recently is from California. So welcome to Texas. Please don't vote the way they did back there. Uh, Florida and Texas are filling up to the brim with people from California and New York and Illinois and Michigan and all over the blue state of the country because of, uh, uh, because of COVID. And now L.A. doesn't like that because of the, uh, the parents' rights bills that are propping up in uh, states around the country. California, by the way, got a bunch of COVID money, as you'd expect. They got tons of it. And they also defunded the police, and that was really important. They made sure those police didn't get their money because police are obviously evil. All they're doing is trying to wantonly kill black people. That is why partially it's strange that California took most of their COVID money, a huge chunk of it at least, and instead of doing stuff with COVID, they wound up funding the police with it because everyone knows that you actually uh, do need police uh, in these communities. And, and, and the, you know, most of the people who begging for police in these communities are the people who are living in the communities. They're like, please, please bring police back. Now, I know there's been some interactions and there's some distrust in certain communities when it comes to the police. But when you ask the people in the communities, uh, please don't abandon us. Please don't. This is already a problem area. We don't want it to get worse. Uh, it was getting so bad, apparently they had to take COVID money and remove it to uh, fund actual police officers. And so that's, of course, not the mainstream narrative, but actually went on in California of all places. The U.S. court uh, now has reinstated Biden's federal employee COVID vaccine mandate. This is going to bounce back and forth as it goes up uh, the, 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 uh, the court system. Eventually, we may get a, an answer from the Supreme Court on it. But one of the things that's really fascinating about this is you put these restrictions in and then things change. People, I know it kind of feels like we're on the, the, the other side of COVID right now because a lot of the restrictions are lifted, even if you're in a blue state. Um, but it's important to note how dramatic this is because you might look at you know, cases or hospitalizations and we're on a lo the low side of it, but not the lowest we've been. Let me give you another stat, which is ICU admissions. ICU is probably the best way to look at what COVID actually is right now. Um, you know, deaths obviously trail. They're at a relatively low number, but not the lowest they've been. Uh, ICU uh, hospitalizations is something to watch. But when you have an Omicron type of situation, so many people have it. Tons of people are going into the hospital with COVID and not because of it. Um, that's been a long time debate on the uh, on the right. It was ignored for the first year and a half on the left. But we've been talking about it since the beginning. Uh, however, with all that being said, ICU admissions for COVID. So you are in there for COVID, you're in the ICU in danger of dying, are half, half of what they've been at any other point during the pandemic right now. Look, you go to, at some point, people acquire immunity with this thing, whether it's through a vaccine or whether it's through just getting it. And at that point, your body does a pretty good job of pushing away the worst effects. We've known that from the beginning. We've talked about it that way from the beginning. Uh, and now these restrictions that were put in months ago and when the situation was totally different are still winding through the court system and are completely insane at this point. They don't re react to reality the way they are. This is why you don't do things through central government. You can't react quickly. You can't make these things work. No human being is smart enough to manage this process. That is what our founders understood. It was their big, big conclusion from being like, you know, this whole king thing sucks. Let's do it a different way. That's what we're supposed to be doing here, something different. But the left keeps trying to pull us in that direction. Let's not follow them there. So do you want an amazing belt that's comfortable, fashionable, customizable, uh, but you don't want to spend a ton on it. You want it to look cool. You want, to be, you want it to be very durable. And if you'd maybe like to buy it from somebody who doesn't despise America, 
How about Grip6? Grip6 is a small company in Utah that sells in the United States, of course, but also all over the world. And people buy it all over the world because it's high, high quality. And it's sourced, uh, almost everything they have uh, is sourced right here in the United States of America. They love the country. They want you to look good. They want you to not have to buy things over and over and over again. They want it to last. And that's why they make great belts, um, great uh, wallets, awesome socks, nice socks that are nice and warm, made out of wool. Um, but also, you can, you can go running in these things, and they're not going to be crazy because they're just that perfect blend of, uh, of, uh, of uh, design and, and fit and quality materials, and they're sourced here in the United States. You can go to grip6.com slash stew right now. Use the code stew to get 15% off right now. It's grip the number six dot com slash do grip six dot com slash do get 15 percent off right now. Now, we don't know a lot about who runs the Uyghur concentration camps in China, but we do know that none of them subscribe to this channel. So to prove that you are not a Uyghur concentration camp operator, please subscribe to this channel now and absolve yourself of any responsibility for what's happening for the to the Uyghurs right now. That's on you. Subscribe right now, blazetv.com slash stew. Promo code is stew. You can check it out there. And subscribe to the podcast. Follow it. Uh, rate and review as well. Five stars is the appropriate number of stars. You can also comment on Facebook and YouTube. Uh, Damien writes, paint Washington, D.C. red in November. Uh-oh, domestic terrorist. D- d- domestic terrorist. You saw that. I, that's not me. This is a, one of my listeners. I swear I will sell you guys out in a second. When they come for me and they try to drag me off to some jail cell, I am just going to name all of you. All of you by name. You're going to go right into their database, so just be aware of that. And it's too late. You're already you're already listening or watching, so you're already on the list. Uh, thank you, Gothics. Uh, she was on yesterday for leading me to this channel. New subscriber, great conversation, and I wish people would look at actions rather than their words. Uh, that's that would be nice. I don't know if it's ever going to happen, but it would be nice. Uh, here's another one. Stu plays Katanji Brown Jackson song. Me gets st- song stuck in my head for a couple of days. Song leaves my head. Stu plays song again. Me. I hate you, Stu, sending bad juju your way. Now, I'm not exactly sure what song they're referring to exactly. What do we have? Katanji Brown Jackson, she is for real. Never had a justice quite like her. She's a former public defender. Katanji Brown Jackson, she is for real. I don't. Is that the one? Is that one? Does that one get stuck? I'm really, if that was the one, I, I really apologize. Uh, make sure <laughs> you get to subscribe to the YouTube channel. And, uh, you know, if we get to like, let's say, 100 million subscribers, I will never play that song again. Um, we have veepthoughts.com. It's up right now has all the uh, Veep thoughts moments from Kamala Harris. Actually, do we have the uh, one we played earlier in the show? Can we play that one more time? And now, Veep Thoughts by Kamala Harris. You know, there's so much about what's happening in the world now that is presenting some of the worst of this moment in human behaviors and then we have a moment like this right that i think reminds us that there is still so much yet to accomplish and that we can accomplish okay that's a i mean how how does she do this that was 30 seconds of speaking and she said absolutely nothing 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 of value nothing of substance she can i mean this is a real skill she can talk and talk and talk and talk and never say a thing how does she do it uh you can see it happen at veepthoughts.com. By the way, if you happen to see a Kamala Harris moment, a Veep Thoughts moment, uh, tweet it to us or put it on Facebook, hashtag it with uh, Veep Thoughts. How about that? And we will uh, we will keep adding to the collection uh, that I know is really important. Uh, also, studosmerch.com is a place to go to get all of your merch, including Nancy Pelosi sucks pens, which by the way, I've noticed you keep buying even though she has COVID. And that is disgusting. I am revolted. I cannot believe you would do such a thing. That's really bad. By the way, it's nancypelosisuckspen.com.